Hello and welcome to the flow. The contemplative mindset deals with information differently, mainly because once the false self is discovered and when the non-binary mind is set aside, the contemplative person is freed from a toxic reactionary response. I say this because I recently read a letter to the LA Times from an anti-vaxxer. He's one of those we've heard before who maintain that the COVID virus is a hoax and wrote that he had no need to wear a mask or get vaccinated. Then he wrote, and I quote, if I contract the virus and become seriously ill, I will not seek medical help from any hospital or health care provider. If it can be proven that I infected someone with the coronavirus and as a result they die or become severely ill, I will plead guilty to a crime. I take full responsibility for my actions. I can think of no other perfect example of the false self. It is a statement filled with self-aggrandizement, filled with hubris, all in the name of personal responsibility. How does the contemplative person deal with this letter, especially in your 20-minute sit? What one can do is absorb the incredulous words and position of the writer. One can mourn for the loss of concern for those around him one can emotionally weep for his lack of responsibility. One can feel anger. Yes, a contemplative can feel anger. But then through the steps and the grace of God and a contemplative discipline, allow these thoughts and emotions to gently flow away refusing to allow dark negativity to infect the soul. Once this stain against humanity is sent on its way, then one can move toward the foundational yes and walk toward the light shining in the darkness. I wash away the weak. I remove the stains brought about by the false self, the false self that seeks recognition to boost or inflate the ego. I cleanse the belief that my reality is the same as others and that my truth is the only truth. I wash to remove words spoken in haste which may have caused harm to others. I cleanse the times I might have been supportive, but allow distractions to seize the moment. I cleanse the need to use binary thinking as a crutch to prevent growth, acceptance, and commitment. I bathe in the realization that God seeks the flourishing of all people and that I am asked to do my part 
to make this a fervent reality. I dry my hands feeling God's simple and gentle encouragement. And that is good enough. In order to love God and neighbor, first learn to love a weed. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Consider the lilies of the field. What he's referring to are wildflowers. If they grow in a field, we find beauty. But if they grow on a lawn, we call them a weed. Wild flowers are carried by the wind, or birds, or any mode of transportation. When they suddenly appear, at least for a short amount of time, they display a wondrous array of color. What a perfect metaphor and example! Why not consider yourself a lily of the field? that can be carried by the Holy Spirit to bring forth an array of goodness, hope, faith, and love. In order to love God and neighbor, first learn to love a weed. We have often heard that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This is usually taken to mean that the sense of beauty is utterly subjective. There is no accounting for taste, because each person's taste is different. The statement has another, more subtle meaning. If our style of looking becomes beautiful, then beauty will become visible and shine forth for us. We will be surprised to discover beauty in unexpected places where the ungraceful eye would never linger. The graced eye can glimpse beauty anywhere. For beauty does not reserve itself for special elite moments or instances. It does not wait for perfection, but is present already secretly in everything. When we beautify our gaze, the grace of hidden beauty becomes our joy and our sanctuary. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. What was the first thing you noticed in this passage? What person or people enabled empathy? Why did you feel connected to the person or group of people? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part. Then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. What questions came into view? What word or phrase spoke to you? What do you think the passage is trying to say? Now, this passage, taken from a larger narrative, fully and beautifully extols the benefits of a contemplative mind. This passage fully demonstrates Paul's gift as a mystic as well. Paul fully understands that when we begin our contemplative experience, we revert to a childish understanding of God. A childish understanding of God with us. But then in time, our contemplative experience grows and matures towards a greater, deeper reality. When one has the ability to fully rest in God, the person can fully see and understand God, which contains the life force of faith, hope, and love. 
faith grounded in a fuller understanding of what it means to have God with us, not out there somewhere. Faith without the need to keep asking for favors or being overtly needy, asking for mundane, silly things like a team to win the Super Bowl. Hope as a means of knowing through faith that with our participation, God will indeed provide opportunities for growth, understanding, and abundance. Hope as a way of seeing the world as a gift to be treasured. Love, the unfettered understanding of total commitment. Love, the reflection of non-judgmental acceptance without borders or conditions. Love, the ultimate reality that you are good, they are good, we are good. Love, the outpouring of God as a midwife, constantly giving birth to wonder. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Engage with all of the text, all of your thoughts. Let the text lead you where you should be. busyness of this day, grant us a stillness of seeing, O God. In the conflicting voices of our hearts, grant us a calmness of hearing. Let our seeing and hearing, our words and our actions be rooted in the silent certainty of your presence. Let our passions for life and the longings for justice that stir within us be grounded in the experience of your stillness. Let our lives be rooted in the ground of your peace, O oh God. Let us be rooted in the depths of your peace. May the wisdom of God walk with us. May the love of Christ walk beside us. May the spirit of action guide our feet towards the promise of new joys, new opportunities, and meaningful experiences. Let us walk in love. Let us go in peace.